Church, will you please welcome back to Cornerstone Church, Dr. Gary Kellner. Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you. Of course, at my age, it's just kind of good to be seen. Any day I wake up and I don't have grass for a blanket, that's already a great day. By the way, uh, before we do anything else, on behalf of Dave and Beth Grant and hundreds of Project Rescue staff in India and around the world, I want to thank you for what you did last week. A lot of you know that India is one of the tough places in the world. After a couple hundred years of missionary activity, the number of believers in India is still well below 2%. But there is an incredible revival going on. And like most revivals, it's always among the poor and the despised. Uh, a lot of what happened is in the last 20 years or more has happened in the brothel districts of the large cities. This pandemic is giving the church an opportunity that it's never had before. Because people can come to a church and get an oxygen generator. Or they can come to the church and they can get an oxygen tank. And so in a very tangible way, without asking people whether they're Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Jain, Buddhist, people are simply getting practical help that they need, and they are connecting one-on-one -on -one to the love of Jesus. And how many of you know that it doesn't matter how we connect them to Jesus, once they make the connection, their lives will never be the same again. So I want to thank you. What an incredible response from this congregation and I know the Lord is going to bring it back to you 30, 60, and 100 fold, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Can somebody give the Lord some praise in this house today? Well, it's sure been an interesting 14 or 15 months, hasn't it? Uh, since the pandemic started in February of last year, I think. Many of us have felt like we were just in the middle of a storm at times and uncharted water, completely unpredictable. And I think it raises a big question for all of us today, which is how you survive life storms. I mean, every one of us have tempest of trouble that blow up and threaten us. I mean, how does a young person, forget the pandemic for a minute, how does a young person overcome peer pressure, temptation, and the fear of an uncertain future? Our kids and grandkids today live in America that for the first time in a couple of hundred years has the promise that kids are not going to do as well as their parents. But if you're an adult, how do you face the stresses and strains of family life and the fluctuations in the economy? You know, I love to listen to the economists and the pundits talk about what's happening, and they'll just very easily talk about recessions and depressions. And it reminds me of something uh, Ronald Reagan said when he ran for president uh, in 1900 and, and none of your business. <laughs> and Reagan defined it as only he could. He said, well, a recession is when your neighbor loses his job. And uh, depression is when you lose yours. And recovery is when Jimmy Carter loses his. <laughs> great, great laugh line, right? But not funny for a lot of folks in the last year. Or a stage of life I'm understanding more about all the time. How does an older person deal with the storms of loss and bereavement and reduce capacity. Now, you know, men just really hate to admit that this actually happens. So they'll get their hair put in a perm, wear a gold chain around their neck, maybe buy a Jeep, and it'll make them feel young again. But one of the things you realize when you hit a certain stage of life is everything doesn't work the way it used to. <clears throat> and that great Pentecostal theologian, Dick Vitale, probably described it best when he said, middle age is your brain writes a check that your body cannot cash. How do you deal with it? Well, there's a story in Luke's gospel that shows us how to survive life storms. It's found in Luke chapter number 8, verses 22 to 25. 
And we read there, well, that's interesting, my little... You know, the, the, the Bible in an in a iPhone is a wonderful thing until it doesn't work. Verse number 22. Um, one day Jesus said to the disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him and said, Master, Master, we are going to drown. He got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and everything was calm. The story comes to a really strange ending in verse number 25. Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, where is your faith? Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's kind of a weird question. I mean, think about it. Pastor Eric is a great affirmer and a great encourager. And he tells you all the time, as he did just a moment ago, if you're in trouble, call out to God. Pray. Ask God to help you. So you can imagine that when you survive it, the first thing he's going to do is give you an attaboy or an girl. So instead, Jesus looks at wet, frightened, barely surviving disciples and says, where's your faith? Now that's a strange question and a pretty insensitive one. Yet I think in that little question is the key to surviving life's storms. Now, in order to survive life's storms, first thing you have to do is know something about storms. Storms are inevitable. They certainly were uh, inevitable on the Sea of Galilee where a storm of incredible intensity could come up in a matter of 10 minutes. Matthew, who was in the boat, called it a sea quake. And it's exactly like that in life. There are storms of sickness and sorrow, temptation, divorce, death. Some of those just come with the passages of life. I remember when I was a kid and my face exploded at about the age of 13 with acne. And I thought, you know what, if I could just survive acne, probably the rest of my life would be really great. And then I thought, you know what, if I can just make it through high school. I don't know if high school was tough for you, but high school was tough for me. And I thought, if I can just get through this, everything's going to be wonderful. Then I went to Bible school, and I thought, well, man, this is great. This is youth camp. And the only difference was I found out after a few weeks that they had tests in youth camp, and they actually gave you grades. And when I saw mine, I decided my dad really didn't need to see them. People talk about my being a doctor and being a professor and all the things I've done. But actually, when I was in Bible school, I was a lot better at playing poker and shooting pool than I was in the classroom. So my dad looked at me and he said, do they give out report cards in that school down there? I said, I think they do. He said, you think they do or you know they did? I said, I think I know they did. He said, how did you do? I said, that is a very interesting question. He said, entertain me. So when I showed it to him, he looked at me, and this is the middle of the Vietnam War. He said, I'll make you a deal. If I never see something that looks like this again, you don't go to Saigon for Christmas. My grades improved miraculously from that moment on. So I'm thinking, if I could just get through school and get into the ministry, man, it's all going to be great. But I discovered something very quickly about churches and about people that is summarized in the words of this little poem. Oh, to live above with the Lord I love, that would be glory. But to live below with the saints I know, now there's another story. What I discovered eventually is that no matter who you are, where you are, how good you are, how bad you are, how smart you are, how rich you are, how poor you are, storms come with life. Some are more intense than others, but they are there. Now, that comes as a surprise to a lot of Christians who have a Disney World theology. They believe that when you come to Jesus, life is like going to Disney World. Now, I happen to love Disney World. And now that we have grandkids, it is a great excuse to go to Disney World and thoroughly enjoy myself. 
Now, there's lots of things to like about Disney World. Even though it probably isn't appropriate to say in a charismatic, spirit-filled church, I really enjoy the Haunted Mansion. I also like the fact that Disney World, there's no flaking paint. The, everything is temperature controlled except the three-hour lines outside. And the coolest thing is they actually hire people to go around and clean up after you. Life doesn't get any better than that. But a lot of folks think that that is the way the Christian life is supposed to work. You give your heart to Jesus, and everything is clear sailing from them on, and then they are shocked when that's not the way it works out. But here's the problem. We live in the same world as everybody else. It's a fallen world. It is a world of sin and sickness and death. It's also a world where two kingdoms are locked in deadly combat. And as a Christian, you aren't exempt from that conflict. You are right in the middle of it. And you have to know that or you are going to be disappointed, confused, and panic-stricken when the storms come. It, but if you know that storms are a part of life, it will keep you from getting caught off guard. It will keep you from asking the wrong questions. But you have to know something else about storms. And that is the fact that storms come not because you're out of the will of God, but precisely because you're in the will of God. You might want to write that down or, or enter that into the notes on your iPhone. Storms come not because you're out of the will of God, but precisely because you are in the will of God. The disciples were right where they were supposed to be. Jesus said, let's go over to the other side of the lake. They were listening. They have got it right. But being in the will of God brought them right in the middle of a deadly storm. Now, when some Christians find themselves in the midst of a storm, the first thing they do is wonder what they've done wrong. It's important to know that just being in the will of God is going to get you in trouble. When you commit to doing the will of God, there aren't going to be any bands playing. There aren't going to be any flags flying. You're not going to get a parade. John 16, 33, Al Gore's favorite scripture. In this world, it's true, he thought it was John 3, 16, but that's another story. John 16, 33, Jesus said, everybody smile real big and say, Jesus said. How many of you know if Jesus said it, it's true? It's true all the time, everywhere, and for everybody. So give the person next to you a great big Jimmy Carter kind of smile. And just people ask me, they say, how do you do Jimmy Carter? I said, it's real easy. It's Kermit the Frog with a Georgia accent. So I want you to look at the person next to you and just say, Jesus said. Now, Jesus said in this world, everybody say this world. How many of you know that Cheshire, Connecticut is in this world? In this world. Everybody say, this world. You will have tribulation. That means painful pressure, conflict. In another place, Jesus said, a man's enemies will be those of his own household, which tells me Jesus must have come to some of my family reunions. Doing the will of God triggers conflict. It causes Satan to attack you. You say, well, that's incredibly good news, and I'm really glad that I got out of bed for that this morning. And those of you who are home watching online, you're thinking, you know, I still think I could probably catch Meet the Press if I flip over right now. But hang with me about five more minutes because I have some really good news for you this morning. To survive life storms, you not only have to know something about storms, you have to know something about faith. And that is clear when the winds died down and Jesus looked at the disciples and he said, where is your faith? So that tells me that the disciples' biggest problem wasn't a water problem. Now, you couldn't have told them that. They were in the boat. The wind was blowing. The waves were rolling. They couldn't bail water fast enough. But you can see that the storm wasn't the biggest problem by looking at the behavior of Jesus. When the storm came, it didn't shake him up. In fact, it didn't even wake him up. 
which is amazing when you consider the accommodations. He is not on a Carnival cruise line with Kathy Lee. He is in the back of a dirty, nasty, stinking Galilean fishing boat bouncing up and down, and he does not wake up. Now, how many of you know that if it doesn't wake Jesus up, it isn't going to kill you? Now, Jesus wasn't suggesting they didn't have faith, but he was saying that they didn't understand the nature of faith or how to apply faith to their situation, and that's why they were so unhappy. So the real problem, how many of you like to know the real problem? You know, when I go to the doctor, I need the doctor to tell me what the real problem is. We don't need to chase symptoms. I need him to drill down and find out what the real deal is because until we get to the real deal, we can't fix anything. We can medicate. Actually, I love medication. Sometimes it's really pleasant just to be kind of gently zoned out. But at the end of the day, that really doesn't help you very much, right? So I have to know what my real problem is. And the disciples' biggest problem was a faith problem. They didn't understand the dynamics of faith or how to apply it to their situation, and that's why they were so terrified. So the key to understanding how to survive life's storms is to understand faith and how to put it to work. The main thing that emerges from the story is simply this, that faith is an activity. Faith is not magical or mystical. Faith is something you do. Now, that's one of the things that you see in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, which is often called the faith chapter of the Bible. And just listen to a few verses in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Number seven, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear built an ark for the saving of his household. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when being called to a place he would receive as an inheritance from God, and he went out not knowing where he went. One of the great old Puritan preachers said it this way, Abraham went out not knowing whithersoever he went, but he knew with whom he went. And that's what's important. Look at verse number 17, which is one of the more humorous sections of the New Testament. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, uh, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Now, remember that Isaac is a junior high school kid. I've often wondered, Pastor Eric, if Abraham really struggled when God said, kill your son, because I think probably every dad in the world has wanted to kill a junior high kid at one point or another. And this is what's really funny. Of, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he received in a figurative sense by uh, that Abraham immediately went up. Look at verse number uh, 24. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Verse number 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea. How many of you know if there's water piled up 10 stories on either side of you, it does take faith to walk through that spot even if you see the water piled up. They passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Look at verse number 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down, and they were encircled for seven days. Now, I read that story most of my life, and I got it wrong. I thought that God spoke and told the walls to come down, and the people just happened to be there. But if you read it carefully, you find out that the power that pulled down the walls was the power of faith. When God spoke to Joshua, he said, here's what I want you to do. Against the best armed military power in the world of your time, with the best army and the best weaponry, I want you to take a daily power walk. I want you to go around that city once a day, and on day number seven, I want you to do it seven times, and then I want you to release a shout. And what activated the earthquake that caused the walls to fall out flat 
was the release of faith. I wish I had time to talk about that this morning. I don't. We'll have to do that one another time. The point is this. Faith isn't passive. Faith is active. It has to be exercised. It's not like a a thermostat that comes into operation by itself. And so that's why Jesus looked at the disciples. He said, where is your faith? He wasn't denying they had faith, but he was chiding them for not bringing their faith to bear on the situation. And it was because they didn't get that that they were so unhappy. You say, well, this is all just perfectly fascinating, but how in the world do you put faith to work? How do you get it out of the abstract and into the concrete? How do you get it out of the ivory towers and into the trenches? How do you activate it when your doctor gives you the C word? What do you do when you get the pink slip? How do you make faith work? Well, just a couple of suggestions this morning. First of all, I think we put faith to work by refusing to allow ourselves to be controlled by the situation. Faith is the refusal to panic. Faith says, I am not and I will not be controlled by situations. Perhaps the Scottish poet Robert Browning said it best when he said, with me, faith is perpetual unbelief kept silent. Faith said, as long as Jesus is on board, my boat cannot sink. How many of you could say that with me this morning? As long. As long. Okay, thank you all four of you. Let's try that one more time. As long. As, long. as, Jesus. as Jesus. Thank you so much. I love that kind of enthusiasm this morning. Is on board. Is on board. My, boat my boat cannot sink. Okay, now that was a warm-up. Let's really get into it this time. These are your spiritual calisthenics for the 830 service. As long as Jesus is on board, my boat cannot sink. Now, I want you to think about what's happening to your boat. I want you to think about the storm you're facing this morning, whether it's a mental health storm, whether it is a physical storm, whether it's a family storm, whether it's a job storm. I want you to think storm. Let's get specific. See, nothing becomes dynamic until it first becomes specific. So I want you to focus on that situation, and I want you to say with me one more time, as long as, long. as, Jesus, as Jesus is on board, is on board. my boat. Now we're going to kind of get old-time Pentecostal camp meeting. Come on now. You know what I'm getting ready to do. Is on my boat. I want you to say my boat. I mean my boat. Now, see, actually, that has no content of any kind. But it's really fun. But it's also a way of my reminding myself what I'm talking about. I'm talking about whose boat? My boat. As long as Jesus is on board, my boat cannot sink. Now, I want somebody to give the Lord some praise in this house. Second, you have to remind yourself of what you know and what you believe. And that's something else the disciples did not do. All they had to do was remind themselves of what they already knew about Jesus. They had seen his power. They had seen him heal the sick. They had seen him open blinded eyes and deaf ears. They had seen him feed the 5,000. They had seen him raise the dead. But they didn't remind themselves of anything they knew And so, because they didn't, they became upset. When you find yourself in the middle of a storm, just remind yourself of what you know about Jesus. It doesn't take a special revelation. It just takes remembering who Jesus is. John chapter 1, verse 12 said, As many as received him, to those who believed on his name, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4 says, God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. But you don't just remind yourself of what you know from Scripture. You remind yourself of who Jesus was to you. You remind him yourself of where you were when he found you, of how he healed you, of how he delivered you, of how he saved you, as he took your feet out of a slippery place and he put you in a solid place. He gave you a purpose and he gave you a calling and he gave you a destiny. And you know what? When I remind myself of those things, I can't be depressed anymore. And then finally, you remind yourself of all those things and you say, all these things are true right here and right now. And I am going to take my stand on this. You see, faith grabs hold of truth and it applies it to the problem at hand. Faith doesn't work like a thermostat. It doesn't kick in when the temperature reaches a certain level. You have to activate your faith. It's, you're not activating pastor's faith or activating the elder's faith or activating your mother's faith. You're activating your faith. And if you'll do that, it really doesn't matter what kind of storm you're in today. It'll change your life. Instead of being overcome, you'll be an overcomer. Instead of fear and panic and despair, you'll have peace and poise and confidence. How much faith does it really take to survive life storms? Not much. In another setting, Jesus said to these same disciples, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, how many of you know that's not much faith? I mean, in the annals of faith, that is kind of a minimal entry-level kind of faith. He said, but if you have even that much faith, you could look at a mountain, and specifically, you can look at your mountain. No matter what that mountain looks like today, no matter how overwhelmed you feel, no matter how hopeless it may seem, you can say to your mountain, everybody say your mountain. You say to your mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And listen to what Jesus said. It shall be done even as you say. See, here's what happens. At the end of the day, you get what you say. If you're willing to put up with it, you're going to have your storm. But if you get to the point where you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you look at that mountain and you say, be removed now. It will be done as you say. Now, God wants you to have great faith. He wants you to have perfected faith. But if you're not there yet, how many of you would just say, you know, I, I, I probably don't have perfect faith this morning. Well, thank you for all seven really honest folks this morning. Even if your faith isn't perfect, you use the faith that you have, and it is enough. I want you to stand with me for just a moment, if you would. And I would like you to bow your heads. If you're home, if you would do the same. And then just take your hands like this, if you would. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your faith. Lord, your son said, have faith in God. And Lord, we have faith in you and who you are in what you say. We have faith in what you do. And Lord, this morning, we receive your word. We grab it. We lay hold of it. We lay claim to it. Yeah, I see some folks just even beginning to make a fist. And boy, sometimes you've got to make a fist because you're going to in the fight of your life, and that's no time to be a patsy. Yeah, sometimes you just got to ball up that fist and say, devil, I'm about to put one right on the end of your nose. Lord, right now, in Jesus' name, we are going to activate our faith. Lord, we're going to activate our faith to face today's storm. We are going to activate our faith in the midst of this medical crisis. We're against this threat to our family. We will not accept what the doctor has said as final. Lord, we accept what Jesus said as final because there is no weapon formed against us 
that can prosper. Neither height nor depth, neither principality, things present, things in the future, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, Lord, this morning, we lay hold of that which you have laid hold of for us. Lord, we lift our hands and we thank you for the grace of healing. Lord, we know that the devil wants us sick, but you want us well. The devil comes to kill and to rob and destroy, but you came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So, Lord, we thank you for healing for the mind, healing for broken hearts, healing for wounded spirits, healing for fractured psyches, healing for heart disease, healing for cancer, healing for tumors, healing for diverticulosis, healing for macular degeneration, healing for every kind of kidney problem, healing, Lord, for every kind of bladder problem. Lord, in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, we receive the grace of your healing. And right now, Lord, we lift our hands and we begin to thank you and we begin to praise you. Lord, we thank you that the breakthrough is on the way for our family. Healing is on the way from our family. An evil history will not define us. A history of abuse, of poverty, of failure, of scarcity, of fear, of confusion will not define us. Lord, we know that we have not received a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And so, Jesus, we thank you right now for what you're doing in the house. We thank you for the healing power that we can feel flowing through our bodies. Give the Lord some praise right now in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hall Come on, church. Give the Lord some praise in this house. Now, one thing I have learned in a hundred crusades in Africa is it's not enough to pray for healing. You have to walk out your healing. You realize that every crippled person Jesus ever prayed for, he said, rise and be healed. And it must have worked pretty well because the disciples did the same thing. Isn't it interesting? He doesn't say heal and then rise. See, so about activating your faith. He says, rise and be healed. So that tells me if you have a problem in your shoulder, you work your shoulder. If you have a problem in your back, you work your back. If you have a problem in your hips, you work your hips. Whatever part isn't working, you work that part. So right now, I want you just to take a moment and work whichever part of your body that is and receive the grace of the Lord. You say, boy, this sure sounds dumb. Well, it might be dumb, but I saw seven women healed of rotator cuff problems in one service in Brooklyn. And if God will move in Brooklyn, he'll move anywhere in the world. Come on, give the Lord some praise as pastor comes back. Yeah, right. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Kellner. Sure do appreciate the reminder. You know, the truth of the matter is the Bible says we're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We're overwhelmingly more than conquerors. You can be seated. And so, uh, you know, I want to encourage you, everybody, that I say it all the time. One of, my, one of my things I hope you think about when you think about me is that the common I always say, your best days the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. Because no matter how bad it is, Christ has won the decisive battle. But the question is, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? And the good news is, you're not good enough, and neither am I. But Jesus is. He paid a price we cannot pay. And a lot of this world's about who's better than the other, and this person's against this person. The truth of the matter is, we should all be canceled. Every one of us should be canceled. But Jesus became the ultimate cancel. So we would not have to be canceled by God. If you'll put your faith in Jesus Christ. So I always want to do this because we've had people come here on a Sunday, didn't make it to next Sunday. I want to make sure you're on the journey to following Jesus. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And maybe you used to walk with God and you're not walking with God anymore. Maybe you've never truly surrendered to Jesus. You always had a caveat. Uh, I will, but... Jesus says, I'll have no others. And so he must be first. Have you given Jesus your first? And if you'd like to give your life to Jesus Christ today, I'm going to ask you to join me in this prayer in your mind. You repeat after me in your mind. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. 
I ask you right now to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And this day, I step down from being in charge of my life. I hand my life completely over to you the best way I know how. Take my life. It is yours. Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, now come fill me in Jesus' name. Thank you that I am a child of God. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you began a journey, a journey of following Jesus. This church, we're on a journey together, all following Jesus. We're not perfect people, but we're chosen people by God, and we are walking this out. And so if you prayed that prayer today, there's several different ways it would help us with you. And at first, on the pocket in front of you, there's a connection card. If you'd be so kind to put your name on, the, on it, and on the bottom it says, I made a decision today. Also, there is a a telephone number right behind me or right on the side of the screen and it talks about what to call you can text to 860 put 2 on your phone get your phone out and put 2 and then you text in there um, 860-499-4888 if you could put it, also put it on line that'd be great that would be um, 860-499-4888 and so if you could do that that'd be fantastic Hey, listen, we always want to close our service with an opportunity. This is part of the worship process. And uh, I can tell you right now, God is faithful. And when you trust God with your tithes and your offerings, he promises to take care of us. And I've, I've seen it all my life, everybody. It's supernatural. It activates God in your life. And so I want to encourage you to do that. There are four different ways you can give. If you guys could put it, make sure, I just want to make sure it's online as well, because I don't see it on online screen. Make sure it's online as well. There's four different ways you can give. You can text Cornerstone Cheshire at 77977. Our push pay app, cornerstonecheshire.com. Also, we have boxes in the back. You can give, and we appreciate you doing that. And, and I just pray right now, Father, I pray you bless us offering today. Father, I pray you'd multiply and use it powerfully. Father, we thank you that you are faithful. And you promise that you will rebuke the devourer when we trust you with our tithes and our offerings. And we want to thank you that you are our supplier. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, thank you, everybody. It is so good to see everyone. We're going to have uh, folks in the front to pray with you. Today we have Grove Track Step, uh, I think it's Step 2 today. It's going to be at 1 o'clock. We'd love to have you come. We'll serve you lunch. And uh, also, does everyone remind everybody that every Friday we have a prayer meeting live here at the church at 12 noon. You can tune in at cornerstonecheshire.com or Facebook, and we pray for the world. We pray for each other. That happens every Friday from 12 to 1. God bless you guys, and let's walk by faith, not by sight. Amen? God bless you all.